You will hear three students talking to their tutor about the presentation they are planning. First, in the exam, you will have twenty seconds to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, everyone. So, you're going to tell me about your presentation. First of all, what's your topic? Did you say you were going to talk about the uses of mobile phones? Ah,、uh, not exactly. We're actually going to explain the dangers of using mobile phones. Ah, okay. That sounds interesting. What are you going to discuss exactly? Well, we've planned to divide the presentation into three sections. We'll have an introduction explaining why we think it's important to understand the dangers of mobiles. Then, on the second slide, we'll have a list of the different types of danger, and then on the last slide, we're going to suggest ways of staying out of danger when you use a mobile. Yes. We want to start by telling the audience that using a mobile phone can be dangerous, and then go into more detail in the next part. Okay, but before you talk about the dangers of mobiles, I think you should mention the advantages. You could put that in your introduction. It balances up the argument a bit. Oh yes, I see what you mean. Right, we'll do that. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, in the exam you will have twenty seconds to look at questions five, ten. So, shall we have a look at your presentation? Did you bring it with you? I've got it here on a memory stick. Can we show you on your computer? Yes, that's fine. Let's have a look. Hmm. Right. As you say, you're going to add the advantages of using mobile phones to the first slide. Good. Who's going to explain the second slide with all the dangers? That's me. Do you think I've got enough detail? Yes, I think there's plenty of information, but I think it's all a bit mixed up at the moment. I mean, you've got dangers like getting headaches in the same list as having car accidents and being robbed in the street. They're all different types of danger, aren't they? I think you should divide them into groups, maybe under separate titles like health. Accidents and security. Oh right, yes, thank you. That will make it much clearer to the audience.、Mm. Okay. Now, in the third slide, you can put your suggestions for staying away from each of these dangers under separate titles. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Have you got any other questions? Um. Yes, the presentation should be for ten minutes. Is that right? Yes, but ten minutes in total, including three minutes for questions. So you'll only talk for seven minutes. That's only two minutes each. We won't be able to say much in that time at all. That's why you have to plan what you're going to say carefully, and make sure you only include the most important information. For instance, you won't have time to give examples. 
but you could put some images on your slides that show examples without spending time talking about them. Hey, that's a good idea, and the audience can look at them while we talk. And another thing, make sure all the slides have the same style. You should get together and agree on one style for the whole presentation. Okay, we'll do that too. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part one. Now turns to part two. You will hear an extract from a radio program about a famous bridge. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to eighteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to eighteen. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is nearly three quarters of a century old, and to help celebrate this important occasion, our reporter Sarah Chambers has compiled this brief history of her favourite bridge. A bridge is more than just a crossing over a river or a waterway; it is a landmark in its own right. A landmark which allows us to identify one city from another. Think, for instance, of the Bridge of Sighs in Venice, or the magnificent Charles Bridge in Prague. Each of these cities can be recognised by their famous bridges. The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is another example of a city known by its bridge. But in addition to this, a bridge is a kind of ornament for a city, similar, if you like. To a cathedral or a palace. Here in Sydney, we may not have our own palace, but we do have our famous and much-loved bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is sometimes affectionately known as the Coat Hanger because of its arched shape. It was built back in the 1930s, and so the bridge is coming up for a significant birthday. Let's have a little look at its history. Although the idea of building a crossing over Sydney Harbour had been discussed many years earlier, it wasn't until the year 1916 that the state government agreed to allocate some money for the construction of a bridge. The chief engineer for the bridge was a man called Dr. John Bradfield, a brilliant engineer who supervised the entire project from beginning to end. First, they had to decide on a design. So he organised an international competition to choose a design, and ultimately got the one he wanted. The job went to a British engineering firm, and the contract was signed in 1924. The design he chose was the single arch bridge that you see today, made of steel with a tower at either end. In 1926, construction finally began. The first thing they had to do was demolish 800 houses around the site where the towers were to be built. The poor families, however, never received any compensation for this. But the project created thousands of jobs, much needed in those difficult times. Of course, like all projects of this size, it took much longer to build than originally planned. It was supposed to have been finished by 1930. But actually, it wasn't completed for another two years. It also cost twice as much as the original quote, coming in at 9.5 million pounds instead of the agreed contract price of 4.2 million pounds. But what's new? <laughs> the opening ceremony took place on the 19th of March, 1932, and a large crowd gathered for the occasion. The premier of the state was just about to cut the ribbon when suddenly a man rode through the crowd, mounted on a horse, and slashed the ribbon with his sword. He wanted to be the first to cut the ribbon.
Anyway, they tied the ribbon back together, and the ceremony continued. The man on the horse was fined five pounds for his offensive behaviour. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions nineteen and twenty. Now listen and answer questions nineteen and twenty. Since then, millions of cars have crossed the bridge, each paying a toll to do so. By the early 1980s, the government had paid off the loan for the money they'd borrowed all those years before, but motorists continued to pay to cross from north to south. This money was subsequently used to build a tunnel under the harbour to reduce the amount of traffic on the bridge. The tunnel was opened in 1992 and cost 544 million dollars. It is 2.3 kilometers long and is equipped with all the latest technology, including closed-circuit television to monitor any problems. And it has most definitely reduced the load on the bridge, as it carries around 75,000 vehicles each day, which would otherwise have to use the bridge. And it's apparently strong enough to withstand the impact of a ship or even the impact of an earthquake. The tunnel has been a welcome solution to Sydney's traffic problems, but of course, a tunnel could never compete with a bridge as a landmark for any city. So let's wish the bridge a very happy birthday. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear a conversation between a student and her professor discussing an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Excuse me, Doctor Thompson. May I speak to you for a minute? Of course. Please come in. I'm Alexandra Jones. I'm studying business here at the university, and for my assignment, I have to carry out a survey of people who own their own organizations. I heard that you are the founder of your own company. And I was wondering if I could ask you some questions about it. Yes, of course. Please fire away. Okay, great. We'll get started. Did you encounter any problems whilst you were starting your company? Actually, it was not as hard as I anticipated. I started out with very clear objectives, so I knew exactly what I wanted my corporate identity to be. It was very difficult to find the correct premises, as the property market in London is so competitive. But eventually, I found the perfect site. The hardest part was structuring the business, as I had no formal template, so I had to create it myself. Yes, that is very impressive. Was it difficult dealing with staff? It's always tricky trying to satisfy a group of people with varying interests. However. I didn't encounter many problems. I found it very important to make the staff feel appreciated, so I hosted a staff day where we could all introduce ourselves and get to know each other as individuals. I was also able to talk to them about the type of work that they would be doing, and gave them the opportunity to share with me the issues they had with the allocation of the work. Okay. Did you hire a management team, or did you take on the role of the manager? Oh no, I already had enough tasks to take care of. 
I employed someone else to take on the role of the manager. However, he never consulted me before making decisions, so I was forced to let him go and hire someone else. And what did the other staff think of the new manager? They had a great deal of respect for him. It definitely helped that I consulted with them before hiring him. They were surprised that he has been so successful in his role at the company, despite the longer meeting hours. Since the company opened, has it had any great achievements? There are many aspects of the company that I am pleased with. However, there is one achievement of which I am particularly proud. I wanted a mural painted to brighten up our entrance area, so I decided it would be a great idea to invite the local primary school to create one for us. The youngsters had a great time, and I know they were thrilled to be included. Oh, that's lovely! Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Have you encountered any major problems since you opened the company? Yes, we are always encountering issues with employment, because it is very hard to find people who are qualified for the roles that we are offering. But unfortunately, there is no solution to this. One of our administrators also recently left to go on maternity leave. Which put us in a tricky situation. However, we have managed to find a temporary replacement for her. It's also now approaching the period when we must carry out our financial training, so I need to find a venue with enough space to hold everyone. It will be interesting trying to organise that event. Oh gosh, I can imagine. I find it hard enough to organise myself. Organisation is a difficult thing to master. But it is also essential for success. Whilst I was learning how to stay organised, I realised that the role of motivation is essential. Okay, that's great. I also suggest that you visit the library, as there is a section on culture that will have some very valuable material on how to develop your organisation skills. Okay, I'll head to the library when we're finished. I think you will find it very useful. They also have a collection of documentaries on the subject of personal organisation, and I suggest that you look up the literature on management of change. I personally found these sources incredibly useful. Articles are also a valuable resource, and we have a whole collection of them in our university library. I advise that you look at section two, where you will find articles on the nature of volunteering. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. No problem. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a talk by a university lecturer in Australia on a type of bird called a peregrine falcon. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty on pages eight and nine.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm Professor Sam Richards and I've come as the third guest lecturer on this course in Australian Birds of Prey. My job is to keep a watchful scientific eye on the state of Tasmanian peregrines. So I'll start by giving you some background to these magnificent birds of prey before I speak briefly on my own project. Peregrine falcons are found on all continents with the exception of Antarctica. So don't go looking for them at the South Pole. They're found almost everywhere in Australia and it's interesting to note that the name peregrine implies that they're wanderers that they move from place to place following the seasons, and indeed in most parts of the world they're migratory birds. But not in Australia, however, where they prefer to stay in one place. They're known to be the world's fastest creature, and they have been tracked by radar diving down towards the ground at 180 kilometres an hour. However, a number of textbooks claim that their flight speed can go as high as 350 kilometres an hour, so there's still some dispute about just how fast they can actually fly. Female peregrine falcons, like all other Australian falcons, are larger than their male counterparts. In fact, the female is almost a third larger than the male in the case of peregrines. While she stays close to the nest to protect the eggs and the young chicks, the male is mostly occupied looking for food. Peregrines typically lay two or three eggs per nest, and after the eggs have hatched, when the chicks are about 20 days old, they start to fly. So they fly at a very young age. By the time they're just 28 days old, they've already reached full adult size. In other words, they're fully grown. Soon after this, at about two months after hatching from the egg, they leave the nest for good. From this point on, they're on their own. Unlike their parents, which have learned how to hunt, the young falcons are not good at feeding themselves, and so during the first year about 60% of them die. Once the birds have managed to live to breeding age, at two years old, they generally go on to live for another six or seven years. When we come across nests with young chicks, the first thing we do is catch the chicks before they're able to fly. We have to catch them at an early age. We then attach identification rings to their legs. These rings are made of colour-coded aluminium and they allow us to identify the birds through binoculars later in their lives. Thirdly, because we need to know how many males and how many female chicks are being born, we note the sex of the chicks. Noting the sex of the birds is a vital part of our research, as I will discuss later. The next thing to do is to take a blood sample from the chicks. We take the blood sample so that we can check the level of pesticide in their bodies. Peregrine falcons can build dangerous quantities of pesticides in their bloodstream by feeding on smaller mammals, which in turn feed on crops grown on farms where pesticides are used. Finally, we check the birds thoroughly, really checking the birds for their general health. This whole process only takes a few minutes. In fact, most of our time in the field is actually spent trying to find the nests, not on the data collection itself. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you'd like to do some further reading... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.